As a small business owner, your to-do list is long. The Knot makes advertising easy and connects you with the right couples at the right time. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast for 15% off your first month with code podcast15. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast. Episode 365, The Spitfires Are Coming. London had long ago figured out, as goes Malta, so goes North Africa. But as January 1942 ended, those same people in London were shown that, as goes North Africa, so goes Malta. As in, they were linked and things were not going well on Malta or in North Africa at the moment. To be sure, Warby and the other reconnaissance crews were doing their part as best they could. But once a convoy left Sicily or the southern coast of Italy, it was hard to find, given all that open water. And men like Warby had help in the form of special duties flight. If one looked closely enough at one of the three main airfields on Malta, there would be seen three strange-looking Wellington bombers. What made them strange-looking were the three large antennas along the fuselage and another two large antennas under the wings. These were a part of the ASV, or Air-to-Surface Radar Devices, on each of these three Wellingtons. These had been up and running since the previous September, but they had made a huge impact on hunting down enemy convoys. First, but unbeknownst to the pilots, Ultra would find out about a soon-to-be-departing convoy. Next, Special Duties Flight Wellington would send a plane aloft with the ASV on board to try to find the target convoy and where it was headed. With this done, Force K would come in and go after the ships. But as we have seen, by the end of January 1942, Force K was a thing of the past, and with all the renewed air attacks against Malta, the special duties flight was down to only one, Wellington. As this would not do, the commanding officer of special duties flight was given permission to gather more planes and men, and one of these men was Peter Rothwell. Rothwell had worked with the ASV system when flying over the Bay of Biscay, and then operating from Iceland. He kept up with the Arctic convoys. Now he was finally going someplace warm. Hell, maybe he'd even get a tan. And yet, upon arriving at Malta, the first thing he noticed was, well, it was pure hell. The men were wearing uniforms that clearly needed to be replaced, but no one seemed overly concerned. The citizens were nervous, and there were very few left in Valletta, the capital, as most had retreated further inland. Next, Rothwell noticed that the planes were kept operational but just, and the quarters for the pilots and the crew were either buildings that had been destroyed or buildings with many bullet holes in them. It did not bode well for the newcomer. If he needed any other indicator of how the stint would go, within the first two weeks of being moved to Malta, specifically Lucca, his resting place was destroyed by a German bomb. So the entirety of special duties flight was moved to Califrana, on the southeast corner, near the How Far airfield. But even this housing was destroyed, and soon the men were sleeping in caves, now battling the bugs and sandflies, when not taking on the Germans. So much for glorious island living. Oh, and Rothwell counted an average of nine raids each day on Malta. But for all this, the men of the RAF were still giving it their all, even if they did curse at their living conditions each and every day. And the newly arrived Rothwell did his part. On February 7th, his second outing, Rothwell helped lead Malta naval forces to a convoy of one merchant ship and one tanker. Both were sent to the bottom. A week later, February 14th, three more enemy merchantmen were destroyed. But these victories were in the minority. At this point, most of the supplies to Rommel was getting through, which renewed the Desert Fox's strength. And sure enough, back on January 21st, Rommel attacked again, this time 
driving the British Eighth Army out of Cyrenaica. Immediately, this affected Malta and North Africa, as up to this point, if the ships and planes of the island missed a convoy, at least Libyan-based Allied planes could have a crack at it. But now, no, that too was lost to the defenders. All this and more forced Admiral Cunningham to send another message to London. This one said, we need more planes, ships, and supplies. If not, not only can we not stop enemy convoys getting to Rommel, we can't escort supplies coming in to the Mediterranean. Thus, all could be lost if reinforcements are not sent. Another message shortly thereafter added that during December and January, there were 432 air raids against Malta. To Cunningham, this was just more than harassment. Kesselring could be planning an invasion, and if Malta fell, then North Africa was sure to follow. Then perhaps Egypt. Next, ABC got down to specifics. He said, Malta has enough aviation fuel to last until August 1st, but the majority of other supplies would run out on June 1st. Something had to give. To the British Chiefs of Staff, they said, OK, we'll organize the supplies, but you have to set up the transportation, civilian and military. This was easier said than done, but ABC leaned into it with a will, which mostly meant yelling at his staff. But he got the right kind of ships together, which set out on February 12th from Alexandria. But now that the Axis were basing their planes in Libya, when the convoy moved out, it was so harassed, despite ABC's escorts, that it had to turn back. Least all would be lost. Malta was in its darkest days. Not only was there not enough planes or ships to project power from Malta, there were now to be, again, cuts of supplies of all kinds. Sugar, food for the animals, even bus services. Valletta had become a ghost town as many shops were closed or had been replaced by a bomb crater. The servicemen had fewer places to go for a relaxing drink at the end of the day. Hell, even alcohol was running out, which severely brought down morale all by itself. And as people are the same the world over, a struggling Maltese brought about a new level of ingenuity, read theft. So now one had to look to the skies for falling bombs and then at the ground to keep an eye on their property, like bicycles, all the while keeping an ear out for the latest air raid siren, which only added to the stress. It was the same for the light ak ak crews. A team of six men were needed to work the Swedish 40mm Borfors. Two men aimed and fired the gun, while the other four handled the ammunition. As the gun could fire 160 rounds each minute, when a raid came of either many or even a single enemy plane, that crew went into action. They would be on duty for 24 hours and then crash from exhaustion. But this was the brilliance of Kesselring. He could keep the defenders busy, nay, wear them out with just a single plane, and often did so, knowing the moment of the invasion was coming ever closer. And the night raids and resulting AA fire meant that few were getting sleep around Valletta and the various airfields. One such example will suffice. A ground crewman was told to go look for the cook as a line was forming. He looked all over, and then, on a whim, he went to the latrine. Sure enough, the cook was there, sitting on the toilet, trying to survive this latest wave of diarrhea, but at least he had a mobile stove in front of him, getting dinner ready. The crewman decided not to tell the other men of what he had found. Later, that same crewman was injured from a bomb fragment and sent to St. Patrick's Hospital. But even there, he was not safe. Soon, the hospital was bombed, and he had to be carried out on a stretcher. Were the Germans following him? Meanwhile, the buildings around the Takali airfield got the same treatment. One by one, the enemy leveled each building. The ground crews moved and then moved again. Ju-88 bombers would fly over, drop their bombs, and then 
the 109s would fly past, seeking out anyone unlucky enough to be caught in the open. Strafing and stray bombs would take a life, or several, and soon a burial detail had to be worked out. Then the shift schedule had to be changed to make up for the lost worker. This happened several times a day. The best that the defenders could do was to build, at a cost of time and energy, protective pens for the planes. So now, another element was added to the ground crewman's work, the manual handling of planes, in and out of those pens. But mostly, this got interrupted by the next raid. It was all maddening. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. The days of the previous autumn when many scalps had been taken by Malta's ships and subs, were over. And for a while, those victories had built upon other victories, bigger victories. But now, the islanders were on the other side of that equation. Now, their losses were building to other, bigger losses. Most of the work in trying to keep people safe, their planes safe, was done by hand, which meant hours of hard work, which could all be ruined, by a single bomb. The enemy would fly over, bomb, and leave, which left the military personnel on the ground to gather up the dead, fill in the holes, log in the latest loss of equipment, and find a way to go on. Later that day, a horse and cart would come along. The horse was not happy as his food was cut as well and bring lunch. The men ate quickly and got back to work filling holes, digging out bodies, and moving their kit as their residence had just been leveled. After a few weeks of this, no one could remember a time before this. If another example of the hell the defenders and the people of Malta were living through is needed, pilot Tommy Thompson will serve. During the second week of February, he was flying over Comiso on Sicily when his engine cut off. The pilot tried not to panic, but going down here would guarantee his death or become a POW, which might lead to the same thing. He was able to restart the engine, but before too long, it cut off again. Truly starting to panic now, his upper lip wasn't as stiff as it had been a few minutes before, but he managed to turn the engine over again, which is when it cut off again. In fact, for a total of five times. Yes, he made it home safely, but he noted in his logbook the entire experience took ten years off his life. With the conditions as they were on Malta, 1435 flight, or the night shift, was returned to the days, as clearly their help was needed. Moreover, Tommy was told that he would be transferring to Egypt soon. He tried not to show his glee to the other men, but it was hard to hide. Adding to the drama, which no one on Malta asked for, one day Tommy and a few fellow pilots, including his CO, were on the Zara Palace, just to the west of the center of the island. Suddenly, a 109 was flying right at them, at their level. 
Having had enough of all of this crap, the CO grabbed a twin Lewis gun and started blazing. As the pilot was leveling off to shoot at them, he made himself vulnerable and was taken out by the gun. The plane crashed a few hundred yards away. It felt good, but they all knew that there were several hundred other planes on Sicily ready to take that one's place. The next day, just to show how bad things had become, Tommy was up patrolling with two other pilots, and it was those three operational hurricanes that represented the entirety of Malta's air arm. Suddenly, a call came in that a German formation was heading for Malta. Nothing for it. The three beat-up planes turned to intercept. Maybe they would get lucky, and it would only be a small format. No, it was 50 109s coming right at them. By the time Tommy had finished counting the 109s, it was too late to turn around. They would have simply sped up, got behind the hurricanes, and splashed them. It still might happen. But the three pilots decided their best course of action was to fly right through that formation, guns blazing. With the button held down, the bullets only lasted for 15 seconds. But it was enough. When the gun stopped, the three hurricanes dove for speed and cover. At least the formation was broken up for a few minutes. And that was it for Tommy Thompson. He boarded a Wellington on February 21st to fly to Egypt. Of course, once he settled in, he realized his pilot was as green as could be. Tommy suggested, rather sternly, that they fly below 300 feet to avoid the 109s. The pilot did not agree with this at first, but seeing the look on Tommy's face, he assented. To add to all of Malta's problems, the news on the other fronts for the first two months of 1942 were also catastrophic. Hong Kong had fallen on Christmas Day, 1941. As February 1942 came, Malaya had been lost. And on February 15th, Singapore surrendered. What a blow to the empire. 35,000 Japanese troops had made prisoners of 80,000 Allied soldiers. The only good news was, well, really great news, was that the U.S. was now officially in the war. As declared by the Times of Malta, the resources and inventive genius of the people of America alone ensure aircraft production, which is 15 times anything which Japan can hope to produce. While American industrial production is greater than the whole of Europe, including the German Reich. And fighter planes were the only thing on the mind of those of Malta. What the paper had said was true enough, but it would take time. Besides, the Americans were still being pushed around by the Japanese in the Philippines, which would, as we know, end in defeat. More bad news, the Germans were only 20 miles away from Moscow. And by 1942, German U-boats had sunk 2 million tons of shipping in the Atlantic, which was affecting the home island, with its need of food and other supplies. And lastly, Rommel had organized his defenses of Cyrenaica, hoping not to be pushed back again. The only good news for the defenders of Malta was that they were finally promised Spitfires. Of course, getting them to the island was a whole different matter. Along with the Spitfires, 15 pilots were also ordered to Malta. A few Canadians, a Rhodesian, a New Zealander, an Aussie, and one American. These men had flown Spitfires, some during the Battle of Britain, and were expected to expedite the incorporation of the new planes into the island's defenses. On a side note, one of the pilots, a Raoul Dado Longley, all of 19 years old, worried his sister as he had recently written to her, By golly, I feel the urge for action, with a capital A. As a father of a Marine who once said, I just want to see some action, Dad, one is reminded that the young are full of courage because they have not experienced much pain yet. That would change in time, if the youth survived. 
The pilots climbed aboard a Sunderland, a flying boat patrol bomber, and their journey would be indicative of their time on Malta, fraught with danger and stress. First, the Sunderland had to deal with electrical storms, nearly taking out the plane, and then the lone plane was discovered by the Germans. Fortunately, the Sunderland had a good head start and got clear of the area. If that wasn't enough, when the plane reached Malta, it had to stay in the air and circle for two hours, as there was currently an air raid going on. But eventually, the pilots landed, only to see conditions worse than they could have possibly imagined. Their pickup vehicle was a bus, and clearly, it was on its last leg, and it had no windows. These had either been shot out or knocked out, as shattering glass was a safety issue. This plane touched down on February 16th. During the Battle of Britain, those times had been hairy enough, but the pilots had had enough supplies, and the situation overall was comfortable, with plenty of liquor in the evenings, but not here. Threadbare was the word of the day. This was their new home. Raoul and his mate, Laddie Lucas, were to go to 185 Squadron at Takali, Tommy Thompson's old residence at Zara Palace. But as Raoul and Laddie looked around, they saw no spitfires and damn few hurricanes. This was going to be rough. As there were only hurricanes on the island, Raoul had to get up to speed on them. But during his second test flight, he wrecked the plane when landing. The new group captain, A.B. Woody Woodhall, recently arrived, thanks to Basil Embry's evaluation of what Malta needed, was not happy with the loss of one more hurricane. But as he had flown in the Great War and had been stationed at Duxford during the Battle of Britain, Woody was a pilot's pilot. He encouraged his men. He wanted to build up their confidence. But with Raoul's accident, along with a few other problems, Malta achieved the incredible. On March 3rd, the island had, literally, no operational hurricanes for the day. Six days later, after cobbling enough parts together, a few hurricanes were offered to the pilots, which is when most of them remembered Tommy Thompson's harrowing experience of having his engine shut down five times. As if the pilots and the Maltese people couldn't take it anymore, fate decided to have a laugh at their expense. Near the end of February, rumors were going around that Spitfires were on their way from Gibraltar. Then more rumors came in, at first uplifting, then soul-crushing, and then back to uplifting. On February 27th, the carrier HMS Eagle, having departed Gibraltar, was ready to send off 16 Spitfire pilots and planes, Mark V's. Yet a problem was found with the plane's fuel, so Eagle had to turn around. When the pilots on Malta heard about this, the weight on their chest seemed to increase. But a week later, the carrier set out again on March 7th, a Saturday. The first Spitfire fighters to operate outside of Britain landed at Takali. 249 Squadron, at this point was just a group of guys standing around because they had no planes, was reformed and given some Spitfires. As excited as the men were, first the plane had to be painted as it currently had browns and a desert camouflage pattern. That would never do over the Mediterranean Sea. Next, its guns had to be aligned. So quickly did these planes leave the home island. Still, all this was done and it was time to send them aloft to give Jerry a surprise of a lifetime. And on March 10th, the Spitfires went up for the first time. As there was an enemy bomber formation heading towards Malta, the tactics of the Battle of Britain were used. The Hurricanes would go after the bombers, while the Spitfires would be above them all and go for the 109s. Sure enough, while at 19,000 feet, the seven Spitfires saw the German bombers and the 109s below them. In total, there were 15 Spitfires on the island, but no one wanted to risk all of them on their first outing. 
The seven Spitfires came out of the sun, relative to the 109s, and dove down at 11.03 a.m. The German pilots had been caught off guard, but they were professionals, recovering quickly. Still, one of them did not move fast enough. Soon, he and his plane were smoking and spinning towards the earth. Meanwhile, Raoul was going after his own 109, probably from the adrenaline. Again, he was only 19 years old. Raoul let loose with both gunfire and cannon fire at the target. The 109 turned away, but not before pieces of it were flying off. Whether it went down, no one could say for sure, but at least that German knew the days of easy pickings were over. Everyone on Malta rejoiced. The Times of Malta echoed what everyone was thinking. Its front page read, Spitfires over Malta, which was all true enough. The bombing raid had been thwarted, but the element of surprise was now gone. The Germans would prepare for their next visit. This was far from over. Besides, were 15 Spitfires alone supposed to turn the war around over Malta? No, but it was a good start, and this magnificent machine returned to everyone what had been considered lost. Hope. Postscript. But the pain felt by those on Malta was far from over. On February 27th, the sub Upholder had gone out and managed to sink a freighter, the Tambien. While still 2,800 yards away, Wanklin let loose with three torpedoes, and two struck true. The freighter was gone from sight in 20 minutes. However, it was not all good news. In time, Wanklin and his men on the upholder would find out that the freighter had been carrying 468 Commonwealth prisoners captured during Operation Crusader at Tobruk. Of those 468, 390 were lost. The Italians lost 68 men, the Germans 10. The crew of the Upholder went on as best they could. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So I have a lot of people to thank. I haven't done it in a while, so let's just jump into this. As far as my latest members... Jan Simpson from Berwick, Australia, Eugene Reynolds of Largo, Florida, and he donated. So, Eugene, thank you very much for helping me with my coffee addiction. Uh, Donald Quattlebaum of Polly's Island, South Carolina, my home state. Good on you, Donald. Uh, Jeffrey Matthews from Noblesville, Indiana. Uh, Louis Moore from Cedarburg, Wisconsin. And the company Little Axe Outdoors uh, became a member. As I've been wanting to get into archery, I was checking out their website. So thanks, guys. I'll be uh, putting in an order soon. Um, Mike Peck from Mouston, Wisconsin. Ethan Eddy from Alexandria, Virginia. Hey, neighbor. Uh, Wilma Walden Mukla from Lakeside, California. Thank you for becoming a member. Gabrielle Robinson, South Bend, Indiana. William Hampton from Grand Prairie, Alberta, Canada. Bruce Tolda from Williamsburg, Massachusetts. David Carr from Elkins Park, Pennsylvania. Christine Kirkham from Salt Lake City, Utah. Christopher Abraham from Ashland, uh, Massachusetts. Brian Mooney from Talking Rock, Georgia. As far as those who have donated, again, thank you. Uh, Gary Greenhaug, uh, George Shea from Plymouth, uh, Michigan. I think, um, Nick Pascal Gal- Galbrecht, uh, and Michael Ezzo. Uh, as far as the people who have bought mugs, and again, uh, some of you listeners went on a street and I had to order some more, but I have ordered some more. Um, as far as the Churchill mugs, uh, Lauren Burstall from Knoxville, Tennessee has purchased one. Scott Fonzie from Gibsonia, Pennsylvania. Caleb Porter from Brookville, Ohio. Edward Clancy from Halstead, Pennsylvania, Danielle Pacelli from Alamo, California, and Justin Steen from Naperville, Illinois. And lastly, um, Christopher Jennings wrote me an email. He was telling me about when he became a shellback when he crossed the equator uh, for the first time, and now they give you a certificate. That's pretty cool, so you can prove it. And he sent me a bunch of pictures. So, Christopher, 
Cheers. Good on you. Thank you very much. And Jacob Hooper, who wrote to me, just recently found the show, and he has it where he can uh, listen to the podcast, I guess, during work or part of his work. So he's tearing through it. Um, so, uh, Jacob, welcome aboard. Uh, thank you, everyone who supported the show. And just to let you know, after taking my sweet time, um, I'm finally putting my YouTube channel together. Well, Paul is. So if you want to listen on that, you'll have another option. If you look in the show notes for this episode and all episodes going forward, you'll see the links for YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. I don't do much on TikTok, but I'm trying to improve that. Just trying to find the time. Anyway, so we're building up to Operation Pedestal, which will be huge. Oh my God, someone make that into a movie right now. And then we're going to go back to the Eastern Front because I miss it very much and I know you do too. We're almost there. We just got to get to, I think it's September of this year. And then we'll go back and we'll spend a long time on the Eastern Front. Um, and looking forward to that. So again, thank you again for listening. I really do appreciate it. Take care, everyone.